This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 36 of season 2 of the Westford Warsman podcast. The Westford Warsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a week a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, September 4th, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago. The first section in uh, this issue is the About Town section. The campers on Nabnasset Pond had a moonlight celebration, musical, social, sporting. I might mention that a uh, hundred years ago when the Wardsman was being written, Namnasset was spelt with uh, two T's at the end. The event was planned by D. Frank Small, selectman of North Chelmsford, at whose camp the jolly evening was spent. The moon was assisted by lighting up by decorative lanterns of, cap- of captivating colors. Those who had a sea... Turn, who, those who had a sea turn of mind were cared for in the motor, motorboat of D. Frank Small. Oak Hill was represented by the Honorable Herbert E. Fletcher and family, North Chelmsford by Selectman D. Frank Small, and many others without reference to small or tall, West Chelmsford by Fred A. Snow, and several boatloads ready for a moonlight row. Brookside and Westford Center were there and left the oily old mill and its care. Everything was grandly small, and that is all. Uh, Samuel L. Taylor, who wrote this, loved rhyming couplets, as you can see by that. The first frost of the season was reported, re, was reported by Oliver Desjardins Tuesday morning as seen at close range on Pigeon Hill, the base of which is moistened by the waters of Stony Brook. Hiram Dane is gathering himself to spend the winter in California. Hiram was one of Westford's uh, Civil War veterans. His daughter, Josephine, will accompany him. Mr. Dane has recently purchased land there by telegraph, but not the wireless variety. Horace E. Gould has purchased the John Morrison Farm near Kai's Pond, known more recently as the Simpson Place. William A. Whitney got his foot mixed up in a car accident last week while working for the Boston and Maine in Lowell and is now afoot at the home of his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Sidney Whitney, on the Lowell Road. The Fletcher Cold Spring Farm has recently added shingles, cupola, and and paint, the real trademark of thrift. Next, the assessors will give it a lift. Edward Carkin has moved from most everywhere to the recent purchase of Horace E. Gould, The Simpson Place. Judson Sweetser on Bear Hill is the only farmer in town who is the only farmer in town who can say peaches this year. Although on Bear Hill, the bears are not there, but if any have aught idea of securing peaches other than by the regular purchasing contrivance of law, they better beware of who is there. George Philbrick, the blacksmith in George C. Moore's shop at Westford Sawmill, has moved from North Chelmsford to the Wooden Cottage at Westford Station. Eugene Ward, a former collector of milk for Arthur E. Boynton, has joined the yeomanry in the tillage of the Cold Spring Farm. The Honorable Herbert E. Fletcher is suffering from a broken rib. Go and see George W. Hill and try his home mixed skill. Uh, you may remember that uh, in last week's podcast, uh, George Hill broke his rib and set it himself, according to uh, Samuel Til- L. Taylor, anyway. A laborer working for a farmer in the northerly part of the town got his arm broken Tuesday, being assisted in breaking by the farmer, so it is reported. Dr. Sherman set the arm, and Judge Atwood may be called upon to set the farmer. Judge Atwood was the judge at the Air District Court, uh, no relationship to the Atwoods that lived on Graniteville Road, I believe. John Adams Taylor is having a house-to-house introduction by himself in getting ages and other measurements and facts relating to the school census. Next Tuesday, he will leave all this and more and start for Miami University in Ohio. William R. Taylor has returned from vacation resting and bathing in Bath, Maine. Uh, John and William Taylor are sons of Samuel L. Taylor. 
the Westford Athletic Association has played out its list of engagements and gone out of business until the start of the trailing Arbutus reminds us, reminds them that it is time to start in and win. Are there any who doubt there was a frost Monday night? Then just look at those beans in the F.W. Bannister farm. They are not able to hold their heads up. Constables Walter Whitten and Edson G. Boynton made a liquor seizure Saturday night on the Groton Road and placed Samuel Cote of Lowell under arrest, seizing his wagon, which contained two cases of beer and six empty kegs. The liquor was being delivered to campers at the various ponds. Cote was arranged at Ayer Monday morning before Judge Atwood, and the case continued until September 11th. Cote has better, had better look out, or he will be wearing one of those striped coats, such as the state frequently uniforms convicts with. Mrs. Sarah Edwards Johnson died at her home in West Chelmsford Monday afternoon after a lingering illness. She will be better remembered as Mrs. Sarah Whitten, wife of John Whitten, for many years station agent in the village, who was instantly killed a few years ago in the shifting of cars at the station. Before marriage, she will be familiarly rem remembered as Sarah Edwards, the daughter of Moses and Sarah Edwards, and spent her early life in Westford at the Edwards Homestead, corner of Brookside, Plain, and Oak Hill Roads. Her early education was obtained, for the most part, in the Little Red Schoolhouse, standing at that time on the Groton Road, corner of Oak Hill, long since giving place to a new building, which in turn is giving place to cons consolidation. The funeral took place from her home in West Chelmsford Wednesday afternoon. Reverend George L. Collier of the Village Church officiated, singing by a male quartet of Lowell. The bearers were Charles, Fred, and William Edwards, nephews, and Charles Edwards, a brother. She leaves besides her husband, Kloss Johnson, three brothers, William C. Edwards, the well-known contractor, Franklin and Charles Edwards, and one sister, Mrs. Alice Hall. Burial in the family lot in West Chelmsford. The next uh, section is entitled, Must Be Protected. A petition headed by George C. Moore and signed by all the landowners of the Stony Brook Valley has been presented to the selectmen requesting them to post trespass notices as the law allows on the land bordering on the Stony Brook with a view to prevent the excessive tramping of land for fishing accompanied frequently with the spirit of domineering insolence as well as setting fine fi fires in violation of law. The law is not intended to be enforced against the neighboring yeoman casting the line for recreation or daily food, but when it comes to a dumping ground for traffic on the electric cars, an effort will be made to decrease the number so that there shall not be more fishermen than fish. Well, under... Well, under contemplation for some time, it was hastened by the recent attempt to burn the barn of George W. Bussey. Uh, I should mention that George C. Moore, who headed this petition, is or was the owner of Mills uh, initially uh, at uh, Westford Corner, uh, where the um, where Depot Street crosses Stony Brook, and then later in Brookside. Recent developments in regard to it show that the kerosene oil used was obtained from the station of the Boston and Main Railroad at Brookside that the rags had been slept on by two white spaniel dogs owned by George C. Moore, being unlike any other in this vicinity, that the subjected, subjected party had a grudge against Mr. Suspected party had a grudge against Mr. Moore, as well as against former Constable Lincoln A. Rededick, whom he threatened to square accounts with for arresting him several years ago for attempting to shoot with a revolver and using individuals for targets, that the subject party was so confused in his actions on the night of the fire that he inquired of reliable parties the way to North Chelmsford, although he had traveled the road hundreds of times, that in this confused condition he thought he was setting fire to Mr. Moore's property. 
As a result of this alarm, Mr. Moore has got the selectmen to appoint Louis Sharkey, special police for Brookside. Mr. Sharkey has been in the employ of Mr. Moore for general re- repairs for several years, but since the attempted fire, he has been transferred to outside patrol duty, night service. Next section is called School Closed. Not since the Concord fight, in which citizens of Westford, headed by Colonel John Robinson, took an active part, has there been such a spunky, spattering uprising as when it was learned that at a meeting of the school committee last week, Thursday evening, it was voted to close the Stony Brook School and transport to the new school at the center, and every protestant has resolved himself into a hornet's nest to get at the school committee with and, although unlike the Concord fight, no shot has yet been fired, heard round the world. Yet there is plenty of loading up, and when the legal time comes, it will be aim, fire, bang, and down and out goes the school committee. Remember, you must practice a good deal in the aim, fire business, for only last spring it was aim, fire, and out goes the school committee man who voted to close schools, and he dodged your aim and remained in office by a larger majority than his running mate who opposed consolidation. A petition headed by Horace Hamlet, the oldest man in town, aged 90 years, and signed by all the protestants was sent was sent to the school committee asking for a hearing. The committee granted their request, and the hearing was held at the town hall Tuesday evening, within 24 hours after receiving the petition. Although the petitioners were out in numbers, they did not number enough to produce a new line of argument against closing. Decrease in farm values and physical hardship both are disproved by the, by the statistics of the State Board of Education. The writer regrets that he is a sort of minority faction of one with a few scattering minorities elsewhere, not yet tabulated, that divides good neighbors, friendships, and even, quote, a house divided against itself, end quote. But until the evils of consolidation are proven and the benefits disproven, stand one for the unanswered facts. So far as learned, the result of the hearing did not change the attitude of the school committee. Next is the Westford Center section. The H.V. Hildreths have been spending the week at their camp, Breezy Point, at Forge Pond. Their son, Harold, has been having his vacation with his parents. Mrs. Lizzie A. Hamblin and daughters Evelyn and Gertrude enjoyed an outing at Whalem Park Wednesday, joining friends from her hometown of Littleton on their church picnic. I might mention that in 1909 you could hop on a trolley in Westford and after switching from one trolley to another go all the way to Whalem Park via trolley. Mrs. A. W. Hartford, Mrs. William L. Woods, and Mrs. John Feeney spent the day at Marblehead last week, Thursday, enjoying ocean breezes and a fish dinner. Mrs. Edward Fisher came over from Swampscott, where she is staying, and joined the party. Leonard W. Wheeler conducted the single service at the Congregational Church Sunday evening. Subject, Our Cosmopolitan Population. Reverend Charles P. Marshall and family arrived arrived home Thursday, and there will be the usual services on next Sunday. Orchardists and farmers are much concerned over the appearance, scattered pretty well over the hill, of the much-dreaded San Jose scale. A San Jose scale is caused by a sucking insect that injects a toxin toxin into fruit trees, such as apples, pears, peaches, and plums, causing localized discolorations, such as reddish blemishes on fruit and harvest. If not treated, San Jose scale can kill the fruit tree in a couple years. It would seem as though they had had about all the pests going, and this is one of the hardest yet to contend with. Miss Mary P. Bunce and Miss Ruth Fisher have been spending the week at Historic Plymouth. Miss Alice Howard has been the capable substitute at the library during Miss Bunce's absence. Edwin N. C. Barnes, former supervisor of music of the schools in town, has been visiting with Mrs. Barnes at H.M. Seavey's. Since their marriage late in June, they have enjoyed a a European honeymoon. 
Town treasurer N.H. Wright's many friends are glad he is so much better from his recent illness and able to be out and about again. Mrs. Caroline Atwood is also in the cheerful class of convalescents. The next section is Graniteville. Mr. and Mrs. Oscar A. Nelson of this village and Mr. and Mrs. Horace E. Gould of Northwestford have recently returned from a brief outing spent at Revere and Nantastic, Nantasket beaches. All the schools in this village will open for the fall term on next Tuesday, September 7th. Next section is baseball. Graniteville Blues visited Lowell on last Saturday afternoon and at Washington Park met and defeated the strong Iroquois Baseball Club in a well-played game by the score of 6-2. to two. About 75 of the loyal rooters, accompanied by ladies with flags, went down from here and took good seats in the grandstand, where they cheered their favorites at every opportunity, and the chances were many. Both sides put up a fast fielding game, and the contest was finished in quick order, one hour and 30 minutes being the official time of the game. The Iroquois Club treated the Blues in a very courteous manner, and every arrangement was made for their convenience. In fact, the local club has always got a good square deal every time they have visited Lowell and have met the reply that the Blues are on the level and that the Lowell boys consider it a pleasure to play in Graniteville. That is a record in itself. R.J. McCarthy was the local umpire. Not a semblance of a kick was heard on either side, and the general verdict appeared to be that the best team won. Gilson, Hanson, Heeman, and Ledwith led the Blues with the stick, while Healy and Buckingham were there with timely bingles. I think a bingle was a single. McCarthy pitched one of the best games of the season and was ably supported by Ledwith, who threw to second in his usual clever style. Next is the Forge Village section. Those who have returned to their respective homes after a long vacation on the shores of Forge Pond are Mr. and Mrs. Bailey and family, Mr. and Mrs. Crowell, Mr. and Mrs. Walker, Mr. and Mrs. Reed and family, Mr. and Mrs. Duncan and children, all of Chelsea. Mr. and Mrs. Saunders and two children of Everett left Idealwood, the name of their cottage, Monday, Mr. and Mrs. Frank Hildreth of Westford taking it for a few days. Mr. Roberts perched preached his farewell sermon at St. Andrew's Mission Sunday evening. There was a large audience present. He will return to Middletown Divinity School, Connecticut, where he will conclude his studies for the ministry. The Forge Village Lions defeated the Pawtucket Blues Saturday afternoon by the score of 7-1 to one on the textile grounds in Lowell. Miss Teresa Lowther and Miss Rachel Cherry have returned from Nantasket, where they had a very pleasant vacation. There was a very pretty wedding in the village Tuesday, August 31st, when Angelina, the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Delaurier, and Mr. Moise Bouchard were united in marriage at St. Catherine's Church. Upon their return, a bountiful dinner was served, and at 6.30 p.m., the young couple took the train for Canada, where they will spend their honeymoon. Uh, incidentally, the given names for the bride and the groom were not in the wardsman. I had to look those up elsewhere. The next section is called Picnic. The Sunday school children of St. Andrew's Mission held their annual picnic at Cameron's Grove, which was located behind Cameron School, uh, now Westford Senior Center. Saturday afternoon, and it was largely attended. The afternoon was spent very pleasantly in field sports arranged by Paul Roberts, who has charge of St. Andrew's Parish during the absence of the vicar, Reverend Thomas L. Fisher. The first on the program was the race of the older girls, won by Beatrice Hosmer and Annie Orr second. Small girls, 100 yards, won by Nellie Orr, Eva Mountain second. Small boys, 100-yard dash, won by Ephraim Reed, Albert Mountain second. The next on the program was the chariot fight. This proved to be the most interesting of the sports that, and was watched by the crowd as the youngsters endeavored to pull one another from their mounts. The prize was awarded to Albert Mount, Mountain, mounted on William D. Roan. The sports concluded with a relay race. About 20 other children took part in this, and it was won by Philip Lordside. 
And that's the news in Westford for the week ending September 4th, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at Westford, I'm sorry, at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.